I looked around the jail cell. The crack was starting to wear off, and now I could make out the features of the cell, the clogged toilets, and the only other occupant, Renee Montaigne. Wow, she said, addressing me. You really beat up those five cops real bad. I'm not worried, I told her. My boyfriend Garrison Keeler will bail me out in no time. He can't go more than an hour without the kinky sugar I give him. I'm the only woman who knows what he really... Mm, excuse me, Kyone. Yeah, what is it, Tucker? I'm on a roll here. I've been looking over the pages you gave me to copy read. You can't put this stuff in a memoir. It's not true. <laughs> okay, like what? You did not spend five years as Mark Russell's sex slave. Okay, I altered some tiny details of that story. You and Bob Edwards did not intentionally crash a helicopter into Oprah's mansion. Look, Tucker, it's just... My life is not really that interesting. I can't keep writing, and then I went into work, and I did some stuff, and then I went home. It's boring. Look, as a matter of conscience, I won't let you do this. I would have to tell the world your book is full of lies. Now I'm going to leave the room and let you think about that. Yes, Tucker told me I was involved in the ritual killing of a mailman in a cornfield in Marlboro, Connecticut, and since that time I have not been able to separate reality from the delusions crammed into my head by the garbage-eating cult I joined. Oh, this is good. Today on the show, writer Daniel Menneker tells the story of his life, his family, his career at The New Yorker, and his battle with cancer. And now... I walked into his office. He was on the floor, naked and covered with ants. Go away, he yelled. This is a personal thing I have to work through. Colin McEnroe. I'm very alarmed about that book she's writing. Uh, I think I need to see the galleys. All right, yes, we are going to spend uh, today's show talking to uh, Daniel Menneker uh, about his uh, memoir, My Mistake. Uh, and speaking of cults, there's a wonderful moment in the book where uh, somebody says to him about the New Yorker, this is a cult. And by the time somebody says that, you're inclined to agree with them. We have a lot of things we want to talk about today, and we'll try to involve you in the conversation when that seems to be appropriate. Uh, you may um, – I'm not talking to about – Dan Menneker, I'm talking about you listeners out there. Our number is 860-275-7266. You may have questions about The New Yorker, 860-275-7266, although that, that will no, by no means be the scope of our conversation. We have all kinds of things we want to talk about. And you may tweet us at WNPR Colin. Daniel Menneker, so great to have you on here. This book goes, goes all over the place. I thought maybe here at the beginning we'd talk a little bit about your, your family story. This is, the book is a, a, a story about family, a story about literature, a story about magazines and publishing companies and uh, towards the end of it, a story about cancer as well. And we'll try to talk about all those things, if we can possibly cram that into the time we have. Um, but let's begin by talking a little bit about your family. Um, the phrase red diaper baby gets slung around uh, a lot, but you, re you, really, you really were. I mean, it, it, describe your family for people. My father was the son, the seventh son of Russian immigrants, um, who refused to get married because they thought that the institution of marriage was an oppression of the state, a bourgeois institution. They had nevertheless had seven sons, all of whom were named after radicals. You'll know some of them. <laughs> My uncle Frederick Engels Menneker was probably the person I was closest to, but there was also William Morris Menneker, my father Robert Owen Menneker, more obscurely, Peter Lavrov Menneker, Nicholas Chernichevsky Menneker, and so on. My mother, on the other hand, was from a very fancy wasp family. Her name was Mary Randolph Grace, and she and her sisters went to Bryn Mawr, majored in classics, and she went on to become, unusually for a woman at that time, an editor at Fortune magazine. So my, some of my job has been very edible as most of our jobs to some extent have been. And that's about it. So I had this very strange mixture of backgrounds, but both of them quite political, in the village, in the 40s, listening to folk music and going to the Little Red Schoolhouse. Your uncle's on these camps, and one of them is a camp I, I know that I've read about elsewhere. And it was, it's one of these camps where when you start to describe the, the, the young people who went to it, it's, it's sort of amazing that they could all be there. Uh, tell, tell us about that camp. Well, I think in the book that I mentioned, I mentioned that, uh, for instance, the publisher of The Nation, Victor Navasky, went there. In fact, when I first wrote the manuscript to show you how shabby and questionable memoirs are, <laughs> I had him founding The Nation magazine. 
He is old, but he was not born in 1865, which is when the nation was <laughs> founded. Um, also, oddly enough, Bill Gaines, the uh, kind of publisher and founder of Mad Magazine, went there. And um, as I think I also say, and there were a lot of similarly lefty kids, most of whose parents were being sort of absorbed into the mainstream of dentistry and uh, medicine and uh, the legal profession. So it was a kind of osmosis. But the music counselor for some years was Frank Lesser, <laughs> who wrote Guys and Dolls. And Most Happy Fellow, which I just saw a fabulous production of. Right. Um, Actually, Guy, Guys and Dolls is the one musical that has stayed with me from my musical comedy infatuation when I was 11, 12, 13. It's a fabulous show. It is a great show. Um, and The Good Speed here in Connecticut just did Most Happy Fella, and I was amazed at that musical. I didn't really know it very well, and it's it's by far more op operatic. I think Lesser took the money and esteem that he had uh, from Guys and Dolls and, and sort of insisted on doing something that was uh, artistically a little riskier. Uh, it's kind of That's amazing That's fascinating. Thing. Yeah. He wrote the camp song uh, for <laughs> my uncle's camp, which I can sing for you. Give me, give, give me a few bars. Here, it has modulations in it that no other camp song ever had, as you might expect. Yeah. Here will we camp among the friends at Old Tahoney, stout hearts and true. We always march right on to, et cetera. Yeah. It, I, I won't. This could be a great compilation, though, Dan. We, a compilation of crap songs written by uh, famous people. <laughs> because Cole Porter, of course, wrote Bulldog, Bulldog, Bow, Wow, Wow. That's right. Yes. So there must be five, five or six others. And by that time, we've got a CD that we can market very easily here. Right. And it's Crap Songs by Great Composers <laughs> is the name of the, our. CD. I we know got, the guy at None deal. Such Records will put it out. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're mostly done, really. You know, just a few little tweaks here and there, and we've right. got something. Well, you know, the, your child in your childhood, summers are this incredible time, right? Because you are kind of on the periphery of these camps. There's that one camp, and then I think there's another camp for grown-ups visiting people at the first camp or something. And so That's exactly right. You're kind of always at camp. I was. I was sort of floating between the two worlds, mainly at the grown-up camp, mainly hanging out with my uncle, Frederick Engels, who mm -hmm. said, uses the name Ainge, and he would always say rhymes with mange. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of um, a grown-up exposure, I mean a child's exposure to grown-ups, because the people who came to the camp were indeed mostly parents of the kids who went to the other camp. And I just had these idyllic sort of free-form summers that I think maybe are not available to children anymore. I would walk around. I would go from one place to another. There was no danger in hitchhiking, for instance. I'd go swimming whenever I want. And then as I got older, I'd begin to have responsibilities like being a waiter and stuff like that. And it's... Um, and I, go ahead. I, I, just, I just can't... I mean, the, when I look back on it now, I just find it... A sort of miraculous that I was lucky enough to be kind of left alone, my brother and I. You know, kids are not left alone, and it's a little dangerous to leave kids alone. Well, you know, I think one of the things the book does well, too, is, I mean, uh, invariably when people of a certain generation start talking about life before television or, or life before digital uh, life or life before almost anything that uh, one has now, there, there is this sort of danger of sounding kind of crusty and self-righteous. Um, but I think one of the things the book does well is sort of is show a life, a life that you led which was full of entertainments and conversation. I mean, a childhood that you had that was full of entertainments and conversation that just weren't uh, dependent on some of the kinds of passive sources that we turn to. See, I'm right on the verge of saying something that sounds crusty in exactly the way that we wish to avoid. But uh, you do it very well there. You make it seem, and perhaps you can do this a little bit on the radio right now, you, you, you really make it seem incredibly desirable. Well, I guess it's partly nostalgia. Um, it's partly what I accused my father of when he was in his 70s and 80s, uh, what I call geezer talk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we do do that. I can't help agreeing with you that I think maybe the main difference between a 10-year-old then and a 10-year-old now is that the culture and the nation were oddly coherent there were only 140 million Americans at the time rather than 325. 
when I was born, and for the first 10 years, there was indeed no television. Joe DiMaggio played in center field. The House on American Activities Committee investigated commies, and even they seemed to be part of the fabric. The whole <laughs> thing seemed to be sort of a tapestry. Now it's a lot of, it's been fragmented, you know, technologically, in terms of media, in terms of communication, in terms of social media. I feel as if we've become decentralized, to say nothing of the huge population that we have. So I think it's, I think it's genuinely, um, it genuinely was a desirable moment in our lives. The country was booming. Um, Eisenhower was the president. Um, there were Henry Wallace was running for the presidency in 1948, and there seemed to be something knitted together, which may be frayed now. You know, it's interesting to hear you, uh, of all people, talk about the the balkanization now as opposed to the uh, the cohesion of then. Because in some ways, one of the one of the moments in which a toggle switch is thrown in this book is when you actually are taken out of what amounts to a sort of radically liberal cloistered environment. I mean, you you have grown up in an environment of tolerance, an environment which endeavors, apparently rather successfully, not to see color and things like that. And suddenly you find yourself in a public school in Nyack, New York, where you have not lived before. And, And in a way, that particular moment is one in which we sort of see that you have been living in a more balkanized America than you thought. You're confronted with all kinds of realities that you as a young boy just didn't know anything about. And most of them have to do with intolerance and hardheadedness. That's a, a, a good point because, I mean, that's an interesting point because, of course, New York, even at the time, was multifaceted and totally uh, variegated in color. Um, And uh, so you'd think I'd be exposed, but I was cloistered in public school. And Nyack was and is not a suburb. It is a semi-suburb, and it has its own fascinating culture. It's a really interesting town. A lot of artists and writers live there, uh, have lived there and continue to. Um, But the high school that I went to was indeed a hotbed of normal bigotry, if that makes any sense. I absorbed some of it, I'm afraid, and have been purging it the rest of my life. You know, kids are chameleons, and to some extent. And when you are 10 or 11 or 12, and you get, you need to, quote, fit in, unquote, unfortunately, there will probably be, if you're going to be, quote, successful, unquote, a kind of uh, chameleonism, a kind of ad- adaptation. And so... Yeah, I picked up some of that crap, and I'm not proud of it. Um, The white kids I knew were racist, and um, I think they're probably cured of it by now. I certainly hope to God that they are. And we also, as I say in the book, made terrific fun of each other. I mean, there was no sparing anybody. My nickname was Schnoz because my nose grew so fast when I was 13 that my eyes were on either side of it. (laughs) <laughs> uh, like a fish. I mean, that's not true, but that's the way I felt. So we, you know, we didn't spare each other either. You know, one of the things that you've endeavored to do here, and this is, we have a, a numerous things in common, one of which I pointed out to you before we went on the air, but we have other things in common, and one of them is we have both written uh, memoirs that are largely or partially about our families. Writing about one's family is really difficult, even if everybody that you're writing about is gone, you know? And it it is, it requires a kind of new examination of really familiar material. Um, you have to look at your parents all over again uh, because you, I think we walk around with our own ideas in our heads about who our parents were and what our childhood was, but since we're not sharing them on the page with other people on a regular basis, they can just be whatever they are. Did, did you find this as, as you started to write about your parents, things that you took for granted that you knew or half knew about your parents were suddenly things that you really needed to kind of wrestle with in a new way? I suppose. I would say, more, I would say that it was more nearly a revisitation of that re-wrestling, um, partly because a subject that I really am nervous to go into um, helped me along about 20 years ago, and that's psychoanalysis. I really don't want to talk about it because it's too boring, <laughs> but it did, re- it did require, it's so tedious. And I think, however, in my case, very helpful and successful. I don't think it's always the case. I think I was just lucky. In any case, they, uh, that experience made me look at 
my life, myself, and my parents in a new way. So what's in the book about my family is um, a sort of revisitation of my discoveries and insights of earlier. I did learn some new things, as you just as you say. You start writing and you say, oh, my gosh, I hadn't realized that before. I hadn't remembered that before. And, of course, things crop up. Well, the, the, cru- the cruelest thing that any reviewer has said, and I won't name the person because, honestly, I'm 72 and I don't remember <laughs> his or her name, was that um, my parents were irresponsible. Mm-hmm. And I can see that someone might draw that conclusion from the book, but they were also, for all their political radicalism, 40s and 50s parents. And we were kind of left alone. And so there was no irresponsibility involved as far as I'm concerned. I think I was brought up very well and was very lucky. Well, I I don't see them as irresponsible, but I think one of the really sort of um, the images from the book that haunts, uh, it haunts the reader, and I assume to a certain degree it haunts you, uh, is so you you have this childhood, and it's really kind of, you make it sound rather idyllic. I mean, it is, a lot of it is spent up up in the Berkshires or or in and around Great Barrington in this this fabulous rural environment with this incredibly colorful cast of uh, of uncles and and their their associates, and, and it all just sounds great. And then at some point you say, one of the things that you gradually realized was that this was done for your own good, but it also allowed your parents to kind of whoop it up uh, back in New York City while they were still sort of you know working at their day jobs, and that you came home on one occasion, and this does come up in psychoanalysis uh, later, you, you came home on one occasion, and there were kind of footprints either going up the wall and onto the ceiling or just on the ceiling or something. And I'll kind of let you pick up that story because it's an interesting one. I was four or five, and the the black woman who took care of me and my brother brought us home to start the school year, and I noticed footprints on the ceiling, and child that I was, I said to my father, as who, what four or five-year-old wouldn't, how did those footprints get up there? And my father said to me, uh, it's your mother's footprints. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, when your mother has a little too much to drink, she can fly. And, of course, I totally accepted that and um, didn't think that there was, a, you know, roisterous party revelry going on. But little by little, I learned there was. And I came to understand this, oddly enough, when I had this recollection during my tedious analysis. And the, the analyst, who was incredibly colorful himself, said, in his Spanish accent, and how do you think these footprints got there? After all, Mr. Menneker, how did these footprints get there? So we had that out. And then he pointed out that my mother probably wore a skirt, and the chances are that when she was upside down, and I'm going to leave it at this, Mm -hmm. the skirt fell down around her upper body and wasn't that racy, and that's why I was so interested. Total Freudian freak. (laughs) Well, you know, your mother, uh, the other conclusion you come to about your mother, I mean, when somebody writes a memoir, it really is your one's only opportunity, if one is civilized, to ask people very blunt questions about their life and their family because they've already answered so many of the questions in the memoir. But you you conclude that your mother had an affair with the legendary uh, American artist, Reginald Marsh, uh, who— I suspect that she did, and I'm fairly sure that she did. Uh, It's nothing to be proud of. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I think also, again, you have to take into some account the era, although I'm not sure in that regard that the era has changed that no, much. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> We're still at it. I think the era has been going on for about 4,000 years. but uh, Or, yeah, maybe five, yeah. maybe ten. I mean, just read your Bible. Um, the most one of the most vivid uh, characters in the book, uh, in the certainly in the first half of the book, is your is your brother, um, and, and I think I'm just going to let you t- tell the story of your brother. Um, it, it is, I think, central to this memoir, uh, this memoir, My Mistake, by Daniel Menneker. So, t- tell us about Mike. Mike Menneker was born three years before I was, that is to say, 1938, and he continued mysteriously to be three years older than I was throughout. My childhood, it was very annoying. Um, I couldn't catch up with him physically. Uh, He and I had a very intense rivalry, partly because my mother was, her attentions were so desirable and she worked during the day, so the competition was, you know, heightened by that. Um, We loved each other. We beat each other up. Well, he beat me up. I had no chance. 
and but I was terrific at making fun of him. I my I think my verbal skills may have been sharpened by having an older brother because the only way I could get to him was to make fun of him verbally. So we had this rivalry which continued into high school, into college. But I also had the sense that Mike was very proud of me as I was of him. He went to Dartmouth and was in um, the fraternity that became the basis for Animal House. And I visited there a few times and threw up there quite a few times from drinking too much. And it was a marvelous place, just as funny, just as crazy as the movie. Well, maybe not quite, but pretty nutty. And And Flounder stayed at your house, right? Flounder and Otter both came to my brother's funeral, which I've now just done a spoiler Mm. of, but that's okay. When we were 26 and 29, the rivalry continued. My brother was married, and we were playing touch football. There was an accident that I goaded him sort of into uh, arguing about his knees and because he had bad knees, whether they would hold up, playing backfield, and they didn't. He tore a ligament, had surgery, got septicemia, and died. And as I say in the book, this was, and as I say now, it was a central incident uh, in my life as how couldn't it be. And um, I've been dealing with it ever since, although I think I'm through it. I'm I'm over it. I'm not through with it, but I'm over it. I did hold myself somewhat responsible uh, for that tragedy, and um, I do write about it in the book at some length. Is that why it's called My Mistake? What's the mis- is, is the, the title's a little cryptic. Uh, what, that's, that's, the the seri- that's, that's the serious mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, as I say, you know, I have a funny feeling about the past, and I th- first of all, I think people who live lives without regret haven't lived a full life. Second, I think that those things that we regret are things that we were, in fact, going to do. And, to, and I don't like the word should or should have. I should have done this. I shouldn't have done that. Because the past seems to me to be the definition of inevitability. And I think once you sort of recognize that, you can begin to forgive yourself. You can also try to change your behavior. So um, I totally forget what your question was. Well, actually, uh, it was a very open-ended one, and you've answered it beautifully. I asked okay. you, I asked you, what, I asked you what was meant by my mistake by the title. That was a serious one. I'm, I'm glad you came back to it because obviously there's what I call phony self-effacement in the in the title. I mean, I've had a good life. I've been lucky. I've worked hard. Things have gone well in many other respects for me. So there's a little bit of irony in the title and. Uh, Irony is an addiction of mine, and I try to be straight sometimes, but it's a little bit difficult. The one thing I worried about is that reviewers were going to say, his mistake, I'll say, and then pan the book. But that hasn't happened yet. (laughs) All right. Uh, We're going to take a quick break here. We're talking to Daniel Maneker. The book is, as we just uh, made clear, My Mistake. We'll be back after this short break. Will the end result deflate me? Or will you annihilate me? You fascinate me so. Uh, we're back. We're talking to Daniel Meneker. His memoir is called My Mistake. Um, uh, we're going to sort of jump uh, away from what we've been talking about and, and toward the New Yorker. You know, I, I think for those of us kind of living on the outskirts of the New Yorker, um, uh, and I guess those those outskirts were beautifully depicted in 1976 by Saul Steinberg's uh, famous, most famous New Yorker cover ever, uh, The right. View from Ninth Avenue. But, you know, I mean, if, if you're, first of all, a writer or anything like that, I mean, the New Yorker really is this kind of Olympus, uh, you know, with these fabled people. These You, you arrived, of course, after Harold Ross and James. Thurber and E.B. White and all those people, but sort of during the era uh, of William Shawn and, and William Maxwell and, and all, all the amazing writers uh, uh, who, who, who appeared in their midst under those, uh, those guys. And so if for, for somebody who's a writer who cares about literature, I mean, this is, you know, this is Olympus. Uh, and, and even for a certain kind of person who just, you know, subscribes to magazines, uh, uh, The New Yorker really is kind of this very special thing. And, and you know, it is 
for a lot of people, it's the last great magazine. It's the thing standing between us and barbarism. Who, who knows what it is? But it, it's all kinds of things. And I, for me, as, as searing as some of the family stuff is in this book and, and as uh, vivid as some of the cancer stuff is in this book, for me, I, I don't think I've ever read uh, anything about the New York. New Yorker that made it seem so really human um, that um, well anyway let's just sort of get into this uh, we're talking to Daniel Medigar you you go to work for the New Yorker and uh, a, a lot of the early uh, period you have kind of jobs that maybe seem might seem to other people like drudgery you know a lot of fact checking kinds of jobs and copy editing kinds of jobs but you, you rise through the ranks and I, I don't know maybe I, I don't know even how to get you started on this conversation because it's all such a long conversation but maybe we can just start by talking about William Sean here's this guy who's this absolutely legendary editor but for the 26 years that you work there most of the time you're there in this very provisional way I mean he's essentially fired you you know two or three years <laughs> into your time he doesn't like you very much and as far as I can tell he never likes you very much Unless you read the last letter, yes, yes, the last letter. There's there's a benediction at the end, but to yeah. jump to jump to the to jump to the conclusion, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I think probably uh, I was, you know, after two or three years, during one of which I screwed up in a way that probably had to do with the emotional turmoil I was going through after Mike died. Uh, that's my guess psychoanalytically. Um, it's not my guess; it's my certainty. And um, But things calmed down. William Maxwell kind of adopted me, uh, saw to it that I was given a chance to be an editor, and I went through another two or three years of a kind of walkabout, outback experience, and then things began to work. And I think after a while, although he didn't like me, Sean came to accept me and published a lot of what I wrote and a lot of writers that I discovered or found. I, they would have been discovered anyway. Uh, and so it became um, a time, it became a career or part of a career, a large part of a career that was very rewarding. I feel like the first part of it, as is the case with many institutions, was a kind of more extreme example of the sort of hazing ritual that you go through. You have to do, I mean, for instance, in the checking department, the new checker had to check all the stuff that nobody else wanted to check. The new checker had to empty the old proofs out of the bin. It was almost, as I say, like a hazing thing. Yeah, and news, and then, newspapers, they make you work on the obit desk because, uh, first of all, exactly. that it's, it's a dreary thing to do. And also because if you make a mistake, people tend to call up about mistakes in obits because they're very important to them. But let me just stop you here just, uh, just for the sake of time sure. and because I want to – I mean, yes, there are – anywhere you go to work, there's hazing. But the way you describe the New Yorker, it really seems in terms of sort of codification, in terms of rules, in terms of things one may say or may not say – it, it, it's like working for some kind of Chinese emperor. I mean, you can really get in a lot of trouble for answering the phone hi instead of hello. And there's, I mean, that's just, that's not an isolated thing. There's 30 or 40 highly fetishistic, you know, little social rules of the New Yorker that pop out in this book that make, they make, it, make it sound like some kind of monastery in Bhutan. Well, I, as I say in the book, I rather think of it as Jonestown, um, <laughs> a kind of, you know, repressed literary equivalent. Um, it's all true. It also resulted in a wonderful magazine, as Sean was indeed a kind of self-effacing tyrant, if you know what I mean. And um, the rules of conduct were strict, and the decorum was very forbidding. And I can't say really much. I mean, actually, you answered your own question, and you described it perfectly. It was a strange cult-like atmosphere, which happened to produce in many cases, wonderful stuff. Let me add, there was a lot of very bad stuff published then because The New Yorker was fat with advertising mm -hmm. and it could run multi-part pieces about grains, alfalfa <laughs> and soy <laughs> and God knows what. I mean, also... Well, the, 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 Indone the Indonesian metallurgy piece never got published and I think that's a shame. Well, just very quickly, to give the people an example, tell the don't, diesel... Don't forget, tell don't forget, don't forget, sorry, don't forget it's a weekly. I know. And that's really what's so daunting about it. When you go back into the archives and you see this overwhelming mass of material, let's say only half of it is distinguished mm. or even a quarter of it. It's still overwhelming. The names alone in the New York Public Library archives are overwhelming. 
and any sense of superiority or distance I might have was disabled by this experience of doing a little research and reminding myself of its high achievement. It's it's a, look. It's an amazing magazine. It comes to my house, and it always will. And it really is just sort of one of the, you know, uh, uh, sort of. I don't know. It's a part of the ticket uh, admission price to civilization. You have to subscribe to the New Yorker. But tell tell the diesel story because in, there is a preciousness and a fussiness uh, about this magazine, which I mean, I'd always sort of understood was there. But in, until I read your book, I don't think it really it had quite hit me with the, the force that it does in this. So so tell the diesel story because this is kind of well, hilarious. I never thought. I never thought I'd live long enough to have a distinguished radio personality, if I can use that word, say, tell the X story yeah. or tell the Y story. Mm-hmm. So I've, like, I can't do better than that. Mm-hmm. Here's the diesel story. There was a transit strike in New York. I was hitchhiking around, as some many other people were, and I decided to try to write a talk of the town story about hitchhiking. So I did. But at the end of my hitchhiking, at the end of my reporting, if you will, I asked a guy, an ordinary guy on the street, I said, as I was asking other people, how are you getting around? Oh, are you walking? What? And he said, a diesel. And I said, what? Diesel? And he pointed to his feet and said, diesel, get me anywhere. I put that in at the end of the Talk of the Town story. When the page proof came back the next day, that line was gone. And Sean had taken it out himself. And I wrote a little note on the proof saying, you know, I know we don't like puns. I felt semi-comfortable saying we. Uh, But this one seemed to me a little bit different, a little ironic and above the usual objection. So he called me into his office and said, Mr. Menneker, I see that you would like to restore the pun in this talk of the town piece. He said, I don't expect you to understand this. I don't. I really don't. It's not something that I'm criticizing you for. But if we were to restore this line in your piece, it would destroy the magazine. <laughs> no irony, yeah. no sarcasm. He meant what he said. And now, God help me, I kind of know what he means. <laughs> That's the worst part. I kind of get it in this twisted way. Well, I mean, although, I mean, a sensibility that refined, you know, a sensibility that granular about what would or would not destroy the magazine can't possibly anticipate. I mean, the the magazine has changed so much. One of the things that you get into, the, I mean, you live through the Tina Brown uh, transition where uh, many things right. far more sacred than puns or no puns are, are kind of put up for grabs in a way that William Sean could not have anticipated. But I just want to go back to this for a second because a, a theme that runs through your interactions with Sean and to a certain degree many of the other really estimable legendary names of the New Yorker with whom you're working is this kind of almost sense that's there in the story you just hold, told of this kind of gnosis, you know, this kind of like you couldn't possibly understand wow. this, Daniel. You will never know this. At one point I think Sean says, you know, he, he talks about being a literary editor at the New Yorker as something you have to be almost born into you you can't learn it you know either this kind of magical knowledge of uh, of of the new yorker and what it needs and what, what what's a new yorker story and what's not is in you or or it's not um and it's it's like the scene in in chariots of fire where ian Holm talks about you know if, that, if there's that extra tenth of a second inside abrams i'll get him out get it out of him but what god left out I cannot put in. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's, <laughs> there's this sort of sense of that from Sean, right, that you, you have to have this magical fire in your brain or, or, or not. Do you have a bleeper? Because it's <laughs> utter bull, whatever the word, next word is. You know, he was just using it to try to keep me at a distance. I have a feeling, I know it's weird, that we had we gotten along better. I wrote a... When he died, there was a whole section of notes and comment devoted to him. Mm -hmm. And the first line of mine was, William Sean and I never got along. And then I proceed to talk about um, a little bit about some of the ways we didn't get along. And then at the end, I talk about how much I learned from him Mm -hmm. and the way he edited, which was very sincere and uh, that I wouldn't have wanted to go anywhere else and that I was felt privileged to have been sort of at his side, however distantly, uh, for editorial purposes. I think if we'd known each other, I swear, I think we would have gotten along pretty well. But in the terms, within the walls of the institution, I simply 
wasn't very good at the decorum, as I said before. And I continued not to be. Mm -hmm. And he continued to hold me at arm's length, but he kept on publishing me. So what can I say? You know, I think a theme of this book, and, and, and part of the title, what are the, one of the things that sort of makes the title vibrate a little bit, the title, My Mistake, is sort of things that are right and things that are wrong. And, and you inhabit this world of The New Yorker. And as you're a fact checker, um, although, as you say, there are, it turns out that fact checking at The New Yorker, New Yorker is not always zeros and ones. Uh, there are some gray areas that you get into. But you're a fact checker at first. You're trying to figure out what's right, what's wrong. You're a copy editor. And, and The New Yorker has a style from which very few people are allowed to depart, at least in the world of nonfiction. And, and I think it's sort of there also in your makeup a little bit and, and certainly uh, in your mother. Um, towards the end of the book, you tell this story about uh, your mother, uh, about someone who said something rather heartless to her uh, near the time of her death. I don't know, do you remember the story well enough that you can re- recreate it right here? Yeah. My mother, after my father died at 86 or so, um, my mother lived on in the house in Nyack. And in order to help her, she took in at, with my sort of collaboration we there's a there was a missionary college in Nyack and some of the kids who went there one or two sort of in succession stayed at at, the, at their big house and helped my mother domestically and when I wasn't visiting and so on and so um she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she knew what was going to happen and she was talking with one of these fellows who was very nice, a guy named Jim, um, and asked him, because he was evangelical, what a silly question, I mean, what, sort of asking for trouble. She said, Jim, do you think that when I die, I will go to hell because I'm not born again? And he got very upset, knit his brows, tried to avoid the question, looked around, and finally said, yes, Mary, I'm afraid you will go to hell because you're not been, you've not been born again. And she told me this story later when I visited as a kind of amusement, and I got furious. I said, who, and I want, again, I would like to use an expletive, but I won't. Mm-hmm. I said, who the whatever would say something like that to a dying woman who's led a decent, moral, constructive life? I don't understand it. I don't know, I don't, how anyone could, could, how they could say that and she would and she said how he could say that <laughs> anyone is singular and you want the he to agree with it so you can't say they so until the end in fact something not in the book in her last journal entry and i remember talking about this with the crazy shrink um she wrote the last journal entry in 2 weeks before she died very shaky hand she wrote, is this what I get for feeling so superior all my life? And I told my analyst that, and I said how sad it made me that she thought she was being punished or whatever. And he said, you do not understand. This is a miracle. This is amazing that your mother was still thinking about these things and was not a vegetable. She is still thinking about herself and trying to examine who she was Please do not be upset about this. This is an amazing thing. And you know what? I think he's right. Yeah. Um, I think he's right, he's right too. Uh, and, and just as we're sort of finishing this segment here, just to come back to that idea, though, uh, her idea of uh, with one foot in the grave she's still worried about uh, or, or insistent about anyway, a noun-verb agreement. Um, and I think— Noun-pronoun. You know, okay, noun-pronoun. <laughs> okay, ju- you know see? what? I'm a chip off the old I know. I, that is very clear <laughs> in the book, actually. So— um, uh, you're right. It's now pronoun. Okay. So, um, uh, oh, it's you, so annoying. I, I apologize. <laughs> no, I'm really mad at myself. I'm, I have similar problems, and I'm mad at myself for making that mistake. All right. So, but it's your and, mistake and, and, and my mistake exactly. And and so um, and. Uh, let me see if I can frame a question out of all this. Underlying that, there's sort of, sort of a tension. It's a tension we live through all the time. And yeah, I think you and I are a little bit similar in certain ways. Um, uh, we were also brought up in a world where sort of th- there were a lot of things that were right or wrong. And then you went to a, The New Yorker, which is, I think, a, a sort of a, one of the last colonies of that world. You know, it's, it's uh, for many years the kind of place where 
you know, so, something that's become flabby in, in other contexts. I'm trying to think of an example. So, you, so a writer for The New Yorker wouldn't be allowed to use beg the question the way beg the question is being used all the time these oh, days. Would, God, yeah, what see, nightmare. see, the, exactly. What a nightmare. But what see, nightmare. you and I know what we're talking about. I, to explain it to 75% of the audience it would take too much time. But I, I just wonder, I feel like that's a, an underlying tension in this book and in your story a little bit, that we see you live through a time where some of that that kind of thinking about what's right and what's wrong becomes a lot more relativistic. We see Tina Brown take over The New Yorker where, you know, I mean, she's a little bit more interested in buzz, as, as you have her say. Yes. You know, what's buzzy is maybe a little bit more interesting than, than than Sean's view of The New Yorker, which is let's do what's excellent. Let's do the thing that we know is excellent. Let's not even worry about whether our readers like it or not. I mean, hopefully they will, uh, but that'll be this this pole star, which we can use to guide it, our, our quest for excellence. It's a different question quest there. And, and maybe somewhere in the title of your book is kind of that idea that the, the quest to make sure you get it right or do it right um, becomes a little fuzzier and buzzier. I think so. Again, probably put, you put it better than I could. I think um, that the absolutism, uh, I mean, first of all, the English language is, from what I know of other languages, the greatest language because it's so flexible. Rules do change. There are two different ways of approaching it. That is to say the language. One is descriptive, the way people talk and perhaps make, quote, mistakes, unquote. And then um, uh, prescriptive, which is where you say you should or shouldn't say this or that. You should have a noun, pronoun agreement, and so on. And our language is so flexible with regard to these rules that it kind of controls the world. It is easy to learn hard to master. That's what people say about English. And partly because it's so flexible, there's nobody in the world who doesn't know okay. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Except, you know, three-month-old children, perhaps. So uh, I do feel as if I was fortunate enough to grow up in a time when things were right or wrong, and from my radical side, there was political right and wrong. I have since become more relativistic, not so much because of modern technology and the disintegrate or the fragmentation of media and, you know, no Bibles left in the, in the world of magazines. Um, the New Yorker is doing a good job of maintaining its standards. But also because, I mean, even fact-checking seems to me questionable now because stuff that was not questionable by fact but questionable because... All journalism is written from a, from a point of view, and that's also what you need to check. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. I say caveat lector, let the reader beware, <laughs> because no matter how, quote, accurate, unquote, something is, it still may be questionable. Um, we're talking to Daniel Menneker right now. The book is My Mistake. We have to take a break here. We'll come back. We'll wrap up this conversation, and we will talk about uh, his dealings with lung cancer. And the bar is crowded with people calling for more Here I sit above the rest In my regal eagle's nest On the depths of the night is floor Oh, Mr. Thurber, I cried out I'm nearly blind, he said, but I can still see a beautiful woman standing before me. He died 20 years before I was born. Do you think people are going to hold that against me? I'd like to hold you against me, the great humorist said. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our intern is Tess Aronson. The part of Bill Curry was played by E.B. White. Tucker Ives appeared in our introduction. He was not involved in the ritual killing of a mailman, to the best of our knowledge. We apologize for any confusion. For links, articles, photos, and videos of the staff of the Faith Middleton Show mistakenly celebrating a winning ticket in the Mega Millions Lottery, visit WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, we celebrate pigs with a real in-studio pot-bellied pig, Rosie. And now, back to Colin. All right, we're back. Uh, we have uh, about four and a half minutes left, which is really not enough time to cover all of the things or even really one of the things that I want to talk to Daniel Menneker about. Uh, his book, his memoir is called My Mistake. Uh, towards the end of the book, um, I, I don't know, it, you, you have what everybody dreads. You, you have a diagnosis uh, of lung cancer. Um, 
I don't even know where to begin with that, other than to say, uh, how 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 <laughs> how awful was that to to hear that original news, and, and what kinds of uh, coping mechanisms did you bring forward to deal with it? Uh, terror. That was one coping mechanism. Tears, another coping mechanism. Anger. Although, you know what? That's just not true. I wasn't angry. I mean, people say in the stages of getting used to anything really scary that anger is part of it. But I, I wasn't angry. It was just bad luck and smoking a little bit and hanging around in New York City with its soot and working in an environment where everyone smoked. And so I got this diagnosis of a stage 1A lung tumor, which was taken out, and then there was a recurrence, which to this day I don't think was recurrence. I think it was always there. Two or three malignant no nodes, which were n nodules, which were treated with um, something called stereotactic body radiation therapy, which is extremely futuristic, and I can't explain it here, though I think I understand it. And for three years now, I have had good acquaintance with my friend Ned, no evidence of disease. But it was an ordeal. It chemotherapy, surgery, the whole thing had to stay still for an hour. Do you know how hard that is What <laughs> for someone like me, a New Yorker? No. Very difficult. Uh, right now, I feel fine. I feel very lucky to have been treated so carefully and well. And the cancer, in some ways, while I would prefer to just erase it and not ever have it happen, has been a blessing in other ways. You know, as we hit certain age marks in, in our life, we sort of re we realize there's certain things we're probably not going to do. You know, we're 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 probably not going to visit Kathmandu, or we're not going to write an opera. Or... I did go to Kathmandu. Oh, all right, so you got that one off your plate. I still have to worry about it. But um, don't go. <laughs> okay. Talk about pollution. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I just but you're to go, right. I of course. To, I wanted to go spin the prayer wheels. Well, I, I'm just sort of you know you, you compound age with. Um, a diagnosis and possible recurrence of, of lung cancer. Does it make you think differently about your, your life and work and what you want to do with any given moment that you have left? Turns me into Mr. Hallmark card of the world. Um, I say, I mean, Mr. Smell the Roses. I, I, all those cliches come true. It makes me savor and, and appreciate. You, I guess some people get bitter and mad, although, as I say, it's easy for me now because I seem to be in good shape. So I can be as sort of sentimental as I want to be. Uh, but it continues to be in some ways a blessing. My children seem all the more wonderful. My wife seems all the more wonderful. My life seems all the more wonderful. The regrettable things are regrettable, but I think I've left them behind. And, you know, our dog is a miracle now. And it's so soppy, but I don't know what to do about it. I can't help it. I mean, I can get teary when the dog you know, brings me uh, a slipper. And so there's that. And I think, you know, if it happens again, and it probably will, um, it'll be very sad. But I think I've had this interval of years, and I hope to have a few more, in which to appreciate that which I did not fully appreciate before. Uh, Warren Zevon, who had the same disease, said, enjoy every sandwich. Uh, <laughs> Right. I tend toward cupcakes, but I, I, know, I know what he means. Whatever floats your boat. All right, Daniel Medeker, we couldn't end on a, a better note than that, so we'll end there. Also, we're out of time. That's the other reason we're ending. The book is My Mistake, a memoir by Daniel Medeker, and I do encourage you to tune in. Well, actually, I encourage you to turn in, tune in every day if we, you possibly can, but tomorrow we are going to talk about pigs. Pigs are the smartest animal that we eat uh, on a regular basis. We're going to have a representative of pigdom in the studio as well. We'll talk to farmers. We'll talk to scientists and we'll talk to one person about the religious aversions to eating pork. So we're going to kind of run our thumb down that knife's edge of pighood. They're very interesting animals, but we eat them. And when your job on bees worn off I'll keep on singing no matter what the cost When I tell the whole
Robert Siegel, stop. Audie Cornish is in the next studio, and I know these things are not totally soundproof. She'll hear us. I said, that's right, Kion, he heaved. I want her to hear us. I asked him, does this mean I'll get the announcing job at NPR? No, he said. And the on-air light lit up.